I think, I think we have to think about violence as a choice, not as an inevitability. And it's a choice made by individuals, and it's a choice made by systems. And again, the capacity for violence is there. The choice to use it is both an individual choice and, a, in a certain sense, a collective choice. And it's not just something that inevitably happens. And we have it in our control, if we so desire, to change that teaching into more healthier directions. There's so much unnecessary suffering in our, in our world and in our societies based on human-created ideologies of, of gender. It's the same basic message. Everybody has a right to be treated with respect and dignity. Women as much as men, girls as much as boys. And we all have a role to play. And in particular, we need more men who are willing to start saying some of this stuff. Like I've said, it's really not that complicated a message. And that's why I'm here. Nobody should be bullied, nobody should be harassed, nobody should be treated with disrespect. And when people speak up and say, you know what, that's wrong, you're speaking for other people. And, and that's what leaders do, by the way. Leaders stand up for people. They stand up for themselves and other people. And I remember thinking, yes, there's, there's, there's ways that we can address these issues much more effectively. I'm Bruce Curtis, the Chief Administrator of the Comox Valley Community Justice Center. The uh, CJC is committed to producing or contributing to the development of a peaceable Comox Valley, a civil society. It's the reason that we're engaged in conflict reduction through restorative justice. It's the reason we're engaged in anti-homophobia, anti-hate crime, anti-racism work in the Comox Valley for the past seven years. Uh, and Victims of Crime funding permits us to also expand that, that field of work that we do with our partners. And in this particular case, partnering with the, with the Transition Society and the Family Services Association, the RCMP and CFB Comox has been a real gift. It's uh, been a wonderful experience working with, with these partners to bring Jackson Cats here. One thing that I want to say right here at the beginning, is one thing we need in our societies. We need more men, and we need more young men with the guts to start speaking out about this subject. And I'll talk about the subject when I'm talking about violence and abuse. We need more men who have, who have the strength of character as well as the self-confidence to start standing with women as our friends and our partners and our allies in this work. Um, but I do, do want to acknowledge women's leadership, both here in the Comox Valley, Jillian and her colleagues, and Heather Ney and her colleagues, and other women who are here and not here in the Comox Valley who have been at this for a long time and trying to create healthier societies and healthier families, et cetera. I'm going to begin by sharing with you a paradigm-shifting perspective on a set of issues that historically have been considered women's issues, in particular gender violence issues sexual assault, domestic violence, relationship abuse, sexual harassment, the sexual abuse of children, that whole range of issues that I'll refer to in shorthand as gender violence issues. They've been seen as women's issues that some good men help out with. But I have a problem with that. And in fact, I think that calling these issues women's issues is itself part of the problem. A lot of men hear the term women's issues and we tend to tune it out. We think, hey, I'm a guy, that's for the girls, that's for the women. And a lot of men literally don't get beyond the first sentence as a result. It's almost like a chip in our brain is activated and the neural pathways take our attention in a different direction when we hear the term women's issues. This is one of the ways that dominant systems maintain and reproduce themselves, which is to say the dominant group is rarely challenged to even think about its dominance, because that's one of the key characteristics of power and privilege, the ability to go unexamined, lacking introspection or self-awareness, in fact being rendered invisible in parts of the discourse or conversation about issues that are largely about us. And it's amazing how this works in domestic and sexual violence. And I'm, I'm making this point because we're trying to change the paradigm. We're trying to get more men thinking about these as men's issues. But it's very much an uphill fight because our whole linguistic practice is engaged in kind of distorting that piece of it. I'll give you a handful of examples of what I'm talking about. You'll hear people ask questions like, how many women in the Comox Valley were raped or sexually assaulted last year? rather than how many men raped or sexually assaulted women. You'll hear people say things like in the uh, Courtney School District or the Vancouver School District, how many girls were harassed or abused, not how many 
boys harassed or abused girls. Or you'll hear people ask questions like in the province of British Columbia last year, how many teenage girls got pregnant rather than how many men and boys impregnated teenage girls? In each case, the use of the passive voice has a very powerful political effect. The effect is it shifts the focus off of men and boys and puts it onto girls and women. Even the term violence against women is problematic. What's missing from the term violence against women? Men, in other words, the active agent is missing. Violence against women is a passive construction. It's a bad thing that happens to women, violence against them, but nobody's doing it to them. They're just experiencing it, kind of like the weather. But if you insert the active agent, men, you have a new phrase, men's violence against women. It doesn't roll off the tongue as easily, but it's more accurate and it's more honest, isn't it? Now, I know that there's, more, that there's women's violence against women. I know that there's lesbian battering, there's mother-to-daughter child abuse, there's female-to-female, peer-to-peer harassment, abuse, and violence. But the vast majority of violence against women in the world is done by men, and the overwhelming majority of sexual violence against women is done by men. But you wouldn't know that from the term violence against women, because there's no men in it. But there's a problem with the term men's violence against women, however accurate it might be. You know what the problem is? Some men react really defensively to that level of honest language. And there's pushback. And some of the women who have been doing this work for a long time, over the past generation now, some of the women in the fields of domestic and sexual violence, as well as beyond it, have learned that, you know what, it's probably not worth being honest about some of this stuff or using direct language like this because if you have to work successfully with men in law enforcement, which is still dominated by men, you have to work with men in the you know, legislative assemblies, in the political world, because you need funding for your programs. You need to work with men in your workplace, in the military or civilian workplace, colleagues and supervisors and subordinates. Or you have to interact with men in your intimate life, uh, your, your husband maybe, a mother man you might be uh, romantically attached to, other men in your friendship circles. A lot of women just don't want to get into arguments all the time. They don't want it to get into contentious, you know, all this seen as being anti-male or whatever. And so a lot of these women say, you know what, I'm not going to really go there. I'm not going to talk about this. I'm not going to use phrases like men's violence against women. I'm going to say violence against women. I'm going to use passive voice. I'm not really going to say this is really about cultural ideas about manhood. It's none of that because I don't want to get into these arguments. So a lot of women have ended up using gender neutral language and talking about it like it's not really a gender thing you know most of the victims are women most of the perpetrators are men but there are men victims there are women perpetrators and you know it's not really a gender thing when, when of course it is really a gender thing and by the way let me just say parenthetically it's a gender thing even when women do it okay it's it's a gender thing you can't take gender out of the equation when it comes to violence interpersonal violence gender is the single most important category to talk about and I'll make that point even more emphatically when I show you some clips you know we talk about how the culture helps to shape and especially the the media culture helps to shape norms of masculinity and the relationship between those norms and violence of, of all various kinds. It's, 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 it's amazing how little there is in, in the public conversation discussion about uh, gender as it relates to violence, uh, which to me is amazing because it's the single most important factor. Jackson Katz is an educator, author, filmmaker, and cultural theorist who is internationally recognized for his groundbreaking work in gender violence prevention, education, and critical media literacy. In 1993... I'm Heather Ney, and I'm the executive director at the Comox Valley Transition Society. And the organization began in 1987. And as the executive director, I see my role as supporting the staff to provide the service to women who have experienced violence in relationship and to children. And the thing that the people probably know the organization for most readily is Lily House, the transition house that provides um, immediate short-term shelter for women who have been abused and their children. Uh, the first year we did it, we, want, we thought it would be fantastic if we could have some big event associated with Peace Begins at Home, Purple Ribbon Campaign, and that, you know, we always had Jackson Katz in mind specifically for that. He's a very powerful speaker. He takes what shouldn't be a really complicated idea, but somehow is, and makes it pretty simple. The idea that women have done a tremendous amount of work to support the victims of violence against women, and it's overdue time for men to stand up and really speak out about um, prevention of violence and about uh, how uh, men speak about women. Men, you know, men need to be 
to be kind of challenging each other. I think we need more men who are willing to say some of this stuff. And I do think more men, especially in parts of the culture that have been resistant, including the sports culture, the military culture, the police culture, and other kinds of traditional male culture, I think men in those subcultures need to be saying this stuff out loud and routinely and regularly, and standing with women as our friends, our partners, and our allies in this work, not allowing anybody to believe the nonsense that this is a men against women, this is a battle between the sexes, and what is this guy and not some other guys doing taking the side of women against men? This is nonsense. It's ridiculous. It's reductive and simplistic and problematic thinking. We're, you know, we're in the 21st century. It's time we move beyond some of that silliness. This is just bad thinking. I'm offended intellectually as well as ethically <laughs> by that level of simplicity. Everything that affects women affects men by definition. We live in the world together. Everything that affects uh, men affects women by definition. I believe that a lot of men agree with a lot of what I am saying. And I and my colleagues have been working with men in really traditional areas for a long time. You know, sports, military cultures, in schools, in communities. And, and in racially diverse and socioeconomically diverse settings all over the place, including parts of the world. My experience has been there's much more support from men than there is negative pushback, especially once men get beyond the initial defensiveness that they might feel coming to an event or a training or a workshop or a school setting or whatever, because sometimes guys would just have this sort of you know, fantastical notion of what's going to happen. I'm just going to get bashed. And they don't realize that that's not what good educators do. That's not what good social activists do. They don't just say, you're bad men. It's like, let's talk. Let's have honest discussions about, about what's going on here and how we define manhood and how that hurts women, how it hurts other men. We have these honest conversations. And most men, in my experience, are really supportive. And I think a lot of men have been bullied into silence. And by the way, not just boys, but even adult men. I think even adult men make sometimes calculations that, you know what, I agree with such and such. I agree with the way, I don't like the way that this guy is acting or how he treats women or talks about women or the sexism that's, you know, inherent in his belief system. But I'm not going to really say anything about that because, you know what, it's kind of awkward and it's kind of like he might think that I'm a little, you know, PC or whatever it is. Guys will have reasons. And so there's an awful lot of silence in male culture about this stuff, isn't there? This is how power works, through, in this case, through invisibility, through invisibility, through lack of sort of bringing call to consciousness, it, 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 it operates in a, in a stealth way. And that's, that's one of the challenges of those of us who want to change the paradigm in this work and, the, and, the, and in the world, is we have to make visible what has been rendered invisible. Dr. Katz is also the author of The Macho Paradox, Why Some Men Hurt Women and How All Men Can Help and Leading Men, The Presidential Campaign, and The Politics of Manhood. He's appeared on numerous radio and TV programs across North America, Europe, and Australia, including The Oprah Winfrey Show, Good Morning America, and The ABC News Show 2000. My name is Jillian Ermanen. I am the Executive Director for Comox Valley Family Services Association. Uh, we've been in the Comox Valley for, since 1974, and we offer a variety of different programs for children, youth, and families. We offer everything uh, from prevention programs, our Healthy Families program, to specialized programs such as our Sexual Abuse Intervention program and our Community-Based Victim Services program. And we also have uh, a program called the Family Development Program that works with children and families who are being identified at being at risk through the Ministry of Children and Families. We're a community partner with the Comox Valley Transition Society with the Peace Begins at Home campaign. So this campaign is about getting uh, families and the community aware that it's important to look first in your own home to have that awareness of how violence and assault affects all of us. This isn't just about the victims that come to our services, this is about the whole community. A lot of professionals know about Dr. Jackson Katz, but this is an opportunity for the average person in the Comox Valley to gain a better understanding of the issues that occur around violence. But I'm also gonna argue that these are leadership issues for men, not just men's issues. What do I mean by leadership issues for men? I mean that if you're a man in a position of leadership, and that you can define that very broadly in your family, in your uh, faith community, in politics, in labor unions, in business, in sports culture, in education, media, everywhere. If you're a, a man who's a leader, you need to know about gender violence issues. You need to know the connection between gender violence issues and a whole range of other issues. Peace begins at home, you know that, that, that your slogan, which is right on the money? 
There's no peace on the streets if there's no peace at home. There's no peace in the community if there's no peace in the family. Again, 21st century connections we need to be making is that there's a connection, direct connection, between the intimate sphere and the family and the public sphere. And one of the connections is the crucible for so much bad behavior by men in the public world is violence done to them in the private world. So much of the bad behavior. Boys who have been abused are orders of magnitude more likely to become abusive of others than boys who have not been abused. Because so much of the way that we teach boys and men to respond to trauma is to traumatize other people. So I've been hurt, I'm going to hurt somebody else. Somebody took something from me, I'm going to take it from somebody else. Which is why the vast majority of school shootings are revenge killings by boys who have been bullied. It's not, it's not, you know, it's not quantum physics. It's not that complicated. If we, anybody just had the guts to start saying it out loud, we'd, we'd have a thoughtful conversation about it. It's amazing how the obvious doesn't get stated. In 1997, Katz created and directed the first worldwide gender violence prevention program in the history of the US Marine Corps. He and his colleagues have been centrally involved in the development and implementation of system-wide bystander intervention training in the US Air Force and Navy. MVP has also worked with the US Army on bases in the States and overseas in Iraq. From 2000 to 2003... Hello, my name is uh, Padre Matthew Lucas. I am the senior chaplain here at uh, 19 Wing. Um, I have two other chaplains that work for me as well uh, here on the base, and together we provide chaplaincy services. Um, 19 Wing is a, a base responsible for uh, long-range control of the, of the coastal area, that's uh, the vast coastal area here, as well as uh, search and rescue. I, I, I see uh, the importance of his argument, and uh, for us here, we, we understand that violence is a part of society as a whole, and, and because of that, uh, we have a lot of programs in place as well to, to assist our members, as well as the Canadian Forces as a whole, in addressing issues of, of violence. But most of all, we're, we're more concerned about resilience, we're not only in the member uh, who serves in the Canadian Forces, but also resilience in the family, and that's why we have a lot of programs and services in place to assist both the member and, and the family. The shift in the paradigm, I talked earlier a lot about this whole idea we need to shift our thinking. Well, a lot of people will say if violence is not um, necessarily predetermined genetically or biologically, it must be learned behavior. That's, that's the mantra that so many people have, have uh, expressed over the past generation, learned behavior. But I don't like the term learned behavior because it's passive. I'd rather say it's taught behavior because everything that's being learned is being taught, but if you shift the language from learned to taught, it shifts the onus of responsibility onto those of us who are teaching our sons and men more generally what it means to be a man. And media, as I've said, is the great pedagogical or teaching force of our time, so that needs to be brought into the conversation as well. They brought CTRs, we got PMAGs, we got EMAGs. It's a dirty little secret that the video game industry and the Hollywood film industry get paid by the firearms industry to feature popular gun brands in their games and movies, and that the American military uses Call of Duty and other video games in their recruitment and training. Watch and learn. And the reason this matters so much is that while we've been debating whether guns or movies and video games are more to blame for violence, We've missed how both of these industries have combined to glorify not only violence, but a particular brand of violent masculinity. Awesome. The fact is that when we talk about a culture of violence in America, we're almost always talking about a culture of violent masculinity. And when we talk about a culture of violent masculinity, we're talking about what the culture teaches boys about what it means to be a man. There's all kinds of ways that people don't engage with the more you know, mundane facts, like what are we gonna do about changing how we socialize boys? What are we gonna do about how we change social norms? What's the role of, of the media culture, for example, in helping to shape social norms? And how are we gonna change that? These are overwhelmingly hard questions and a lot of people just don't wanna go there. The typical perpetrator of these crimes is not a sick man. He's not a sociopath. He's not mentally ill or deeply disturbed. There's some cases where people say there's a walking time bomb and you know we knew something was gonna happen, but in so many other cases, and I don't mean just extreme cases like guys going in with knives in a school, I'm talking about domestic violence perpetrators and other forms of abuse by normal average guys, cutting across class, race, ethnicity. They show up in court and they like, you know, there's no way I would do something like that. You know, and people believe it because they think uh, he, you know, he's not Freddy Krueger. And the only person that could commit that crime is a Freddy Krueger. Because people are so, I think, wedded to the idea that perpetrators are sick, 
and twisted and different from us, if you will. They're monsters. Because if you monsterize the perpetrator, then you don't have to be introspective anymore. You don't have to say, wait a second, I'm the same society that produced him, produced me, and what role do I play in helping to perpetuate some of the ideologies of gender and, and sexism or racism or whatever it is? Uh, what role do I have to play in changing that? If the guy is a monster, then we can just check out and say, you know what, you can't do anything about it. And some people who claim religious beliefs, they'll say, there's just evil. You just have to reconcile yourself to the presence of evil in the world, some things we can't understand. Boys will be boys is a statement that's often made in defense of bad behavior by boys and men. And I think it's an anti-male statement. You know why? Because it presumes that boys are not ethical beings, that men are not moral agents who can make decisions and ethical decisions but rather we're just beasts you know, who are kind of overcome by hormonal and testosterone urges that dictate our behavior. And I think that sells men short. By the way, it's the same thing as victim blaming. Victim blaming is easy. The, one of the reasons why people bl blame victims so often is because it's a lot harder to take responsibility and, a, and hold perpetrators accountable than it is to blame victims. If you're a friend of somebody who's been a victim, it's a bad thing, it's a horrible thing, okay? Who, who wants to think about your friend as the victim? But it's even worse, I think, to think of your friend as a perpetrator. In other words, it's one thing to say, my friend was raped. It's another to say, my friend is a rapist. And because, because not only does that, mean, that, does that mean that that person is not the person that you thought you knew, if you will, but it implicates you on some level, <laughs> like, because you're his friend. And so therefore, what is it about you that might have to be looking under the, it might, might require some introspection. Blaming the victim is the low-hanging fruit. You don't have to do anything like that. It's just like, oh, she's just making it up. She's just exaggerating. She's got a problem, you know. That means that we, I don't have to really do anything about it. You follow me? And I think that's, I mean, there's other reasons for it. I think that's the heart of it right there. So there's all these processes that we're trying to work against um, when we're trying to change the paradigm in our, uh, in our cultures around these issues. He really states the obvious, but he states it in such a way that... Uh, anyone listening to him is riveted. I mean, he's, he's telling us what we all already know. It's just that we need someone to put it into words, and he does it really, really well. It goes with the Purple Ribbon campaign. It's about awareness, and, uh, you know, a lot of people live their lives, and they're, um, you know, they're not really aware of what's happening in the community. A lot of people, you know, they, they've never been exposed to domestic violence. There's a, there's a lot of people in the community who've never been exposed to crime, and that's wonderful, but, um, you know, this is a really vulnerable section of the population and it's really important to raise awareness and that's I think the goal behind having Dr. Katz come here is to raise awareness. Uh, whatever we're not addressing is what we're tolerating and uh, so I think that really applies for domestic violence. I mean if, if we allow this to happen, if we don't speak up, if we don't defend people, then that's our standard and I think it's important that we raise our standards. So we had a challenge. When, we got, when, I got, when I started the MVP program, Mentors in Violence Prevention Program, when I was a graduate student in Boston back in the early 90s, um, my thinking was, how do we get more men to speak up on these issues? How do we get more men engaged in this conversation? How do we get more men who are willing to take some of the risks that I've been saying men need to be taking? So what we did is we focused on, on men as what we call bystanders. And a bystander is defined as anybody who's not a perpetrator or a victim in a given situation. So instead of focusing on men as perps or potential perps, we focused on them as friends and teammates, classmates, co-workers, family members. In other words, guys who have friends or other members of their peer culture who are acting out in various ways, in sexist ways. And what can they do, what can guys do to challenge and to interrupt each other and make it clear to each other that, that their behavior is unacceptable? Not just because it's illegal and they might get in trouble, but because it's unacceptable by the peer culture itself. In other words, how do you get the peer culture to police itself? Everybody basically is a bystander. And, they, and one of the benefits of this approach in working with men is that a lot of men will say about the subjects that I've been talking about tonight, you know what they'll say? They'll say, you know, I think domestic and sexual violence and sexual harassment are big problems, but they're not my problems. I'm a good guy, I don't do this. Like, why do I have to come to some talk or read some book or go to some Take Back the Night rally or whatever? I'm not the problem. I'm a good guy. You heard guys say this? I think this is the norm for what men say, including men on the left who claim to be social justice oriented will say, it's not my problem because I don't do it. It's such a bad argument. But you know what? My response to that is, my first response is, we need to raise the bar a little higher for what it means to be a good guy in Canada in 2014. <laughs> And just saying, I'm not a rapist, is not particularly impressive to me, right? <laughs> just, 
Just saying I don't beat my girlfriend is not something guys should be getting high fives for. And so the point for men is, if you yourself are not abusive to women, but you don't challenge other men, you don't make it clear to other men around you that that's not okay, you don't make it clear to younger men who you have influence over that this kind of behavior is not okay, and that you have a responsibility to speak up and challenge your friends when they act these ways, then in a sense isn't your silence a form of consent and complicity, and that's the concept. As Martin Luther King said, um, in the end, what will hurt the most is not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. In the end, what will hurt the most is not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. So that this whole concept of the bystander approach is trying to figure out a way to interrupt that process and break that silence. And I hope that some of the men in this room, if you haven't already been involved in this work, I hope you get involved in some way, working, working you know, with Bruce, uh, with Heather, or at least contacting these folks and saying, what can we do as coaches, as parents, as in faith communities and, and, and partnerships? Because people will be like, oh, that's a guy from the you know, Canadian Air Force is part of this effort. It gives it, it gives it some extra oomph. And I hope you take that seriously and use it in a constructive way. There's so much more where this came from, as, as I've said, with the resource list. And I hope working together, women and men, everybody working together can figure out how to get, go to the next step. And I hope some of the ideas that I've presented with you with are provocative enough that you'll want to take the next step. Take the resource list, engage with these ideas, go online and get some of these, you know, check out some of these videos. Go the next step. I hope you, I hope you do. Uh, and I hope that your, again, uh, generation is better than mine has been. Thank you. He's totally inspiring. Yeah. I've waited for 20 years to see him. I'm just like, yes. He was excellent. He was fabulous. We learned a lot. We're really glad we came. Uh, really influential. I really appreciated everything you shared. It gave me a lot to think about. Uh, you know, I knew a lot of what was going on, but I, I understand things much, much better, and uh, and I plan to use it too. Well, you know, I, I came and I wasn't expecting to hear a whole lot that had effect on me personally. I have no violence in my life; it all goes well for me. But um, after listening to Mr. Katz there, I, I heard all sorts of things that are really making me think deeply about it and about my son and my daughter and how the media in particular affects me and I, I thought it was an excellent presentation. Well, I thought it was very powerful and um, you know we've got a room full of uh, community leaders here who, um, who were just challenged to uh, take a stand, uh, to not be bystanders. Uh, I think the particularly powerful message came from the uh, uh, head of the Australian military and uh, you know that was an example of somebody from a what we would normally think of as a really macho culture is standing up and making a really powerful public statement. Earlier today, I addressed the media about ongoing investigations into a group of officers and NCOs whose conduct, if proven, has not only brought the Australian Army into disrepute, but has let down every one of you and all of those whose past service has won the respect of our nation. Those who think that it is okay to behave in a way that demeans or exploits their colleagues have no place in this army. If that does not suit you, then get out. You may find another employer where your attitude and behaviour is acceptable, but I doubt it. A really clear message that if, if you don't get this, um, there's no place for you in the Australian military in setting up that these are our values of equality and respect for each other. Very powerful message. It gave me a lot of hope. I, I feel incredibly inspired by what he said. It was an enlightening experience, and it's good to know that other people actually know about this. It was an inspiring uh, session there. It uh, certainly, um, in, in terms of the paradigm shift, um, there are things that I can personally do there just to um, change the attitude of um, the behavior of some of our police officers and uh, impart that knowledge with uh, the community and members there. So I was very fortunate to catch both the session last evening and the session today. And, and uh, again, I'm, I'm very grateful that we had such a wonderful speaker in our community uh, to communicate a message, an important message uh, to all of us. Well, I really appreciate that Dr. Katz has come into our community today because I think that we uh, spend far too little time talking about gender issues, period, but the framing that he brings to it, talking about it as men's violence, I think is a new message and a really meaningful one, a really impactful one. Um, and certainly this is an audience where there's an opportunity to take
take that message then out into the community and, and have it uh, be heard um, in a way that has a lot of credibility. Um, I think it's a really important message and um, I like the way that he is just so straight up about it. My hope is that my students take away a little grain of information and maybe they'll start to act on it. It's good to get the word out about the violence going on and to help try to change the ideas about it. Yeah, and the way that he talked about all the points was really well done. Yeah, I think it's just good to inform the youth about what's happening. Like a lot of us really don't, I think we don't really understand what's happening out there. A lot of us are secluded from what's really happening. And I think it's uh, good that he's just like informing us. I mean, his whole thing about getting it into the schools, yes, yes, we should be doing that right here. And I full-heartedly support his um, desire to see some of these programs implemented in the school systems. And the only way that can happen is systemically. So as we're talking about bystanders taking an active role, um, broadening that to include the, the larger systems of the educational system, and others, um, you know, I think that that's, uh, that's the, the way we have to move forward. I think this show is really powerful and the message is uh, really meaningful and uh, important to bring uh, into our society, particularly to our young people in the uh, traditional house of the Comox, where we're uh, gathering youth from uh, various high schools to meet and be mentored by various age groups of males who are role models in our community and to talk about the uh, teachings and values that make a good human being. Uh, and a good uh, male in today's society. I thought it was absolutely amazing. I feel like I've been um, trying to do everything he's been doing without having a way to be able to explain it. It's really cool, I think, uh, for young guys to have a role model and see that, you know, guys actually do care about this. It's not just women that are talking about it, guys are talking about it too. And you kind of see that in the pattern, the way that our century has shifted, you know, uh, with how the world views men and what masculinity truly is. And so I think that Jason Katz does an awesome job of uh, presenting that. And uh, yeah, it's just a really good role model for young guys and girls to um, just listen to him and listen to what he has to say, but also to find practical ways to apply it to their lives. Because now I feel like I have a, a way I can um, kind of actively express to other, um, you know, friends that, that I have in my life that um, saying some of the things that they say aren't appropriate. Oh, I thought he was riveting and it really gave me a lot of a lot of food for thought. Yeah. You know, as a bystander, if you become active, you realize that a lot of the other bystanders really wanted to say that too or really wanted to be involved too and it just takes one person really to, you know, activate um, a larger group of people who may have been thinking the same thing but just didn't know how to say it or didn't know what to say, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah, it was really great. I feel like I just want to go read a bunch of stuff or write a bunch of stuff or, you know, go out there and just do something. Obviously touching on an issue that affects uh, all Canadians and uh, certainly um, as uh, Colonel Benninger or Wing Commander uh, said uh, during his introduction, uh, certainly something that we as military members can take a leadership uh, position on uh, in our greater community. I see all the time normal, nice people involved in bad situations, making bad choices and ending up in bad situations. And I think if more people were to listen to what he has to say and start some critical thinking about what he has, start, start thinking about the concepts that he's putting out there, then I think that would help a lot of people um, prevent violence. It would, help, it would help prevent violence and it would help a lot of people avoid those situations. I loved his analogy of the pyramid where at the top is, is the, uh, the rape, the assault, and at the bottom is all this, all the stuff to do with beliefs and things to do with our attitudes and how we view sexual assault and how we view women. And so I really liked how he sort of brought it up and said, here's the top level, but let's go down to the bottom and see where this begins. Let's talk about bystander intervention and how we're all in this together. I think that it left people with a lot to think about. And in fact, I've had people approach me already this morning saying, what's next? You know, what can we do to make a difference in our community? So that's our challenge now is to move forward and um, engage the people who have been inspired uh, to do something um, about the issue of men's violence towards women. To have had Dr. Katz here for, for four presentations in the Comox Valley has been incredibly productive. We were able to connect with four very different kinds of audiences uh, and that, that was part of our strategy from the very beginning. When we start the conversation with these different audiences that we've had him speak to today and yesterday, uh, they are then going out and spreading that message wider and wider across the whole valley.
Well, I, I mean, I engage with so many different kinds of people, uh, you know, young and old, uh, military, civilian, uh, men in positions of leadership, and, and these guys, you know, kind of average guys and, and women. And, and I, I mean, I think overall my impression is that everybody really wants to have thoughtful conversations about this subject and, and welcome the dialogue and welcome the opportunity to have, to talk about how we can do better and how we can get more men involved and how we can get men working collaboratively with women. I think all of us, men and women, old and young, have in our self-interest to have more thoughtful conversations, dialogue, in information, engagement, um, because, because again, I've said this so many times in the last you know, 24 hours, there's just too much violence. There's too much violence in the family, there's too much violence in the streets, there's too much sexual assault, there's too much bullying, and we can do better. We can clearly do better if we have more people engaged in, in the process. So I hope, I hope that my visit to Comox has been a part of that process. I hope that we've been able to stimulate some thinking, some thought, some perhaps redirection of old-fashioned thinking in a direction that will lead to a better society for us all.